Greetings, and welcome to the second official meeting of the Appalachian Mystery Society. I'm the Mothman Historian, and today I'm joined by three fellow correspondents, the best Virginian, Valerie, and Dave. The purpose of the previous meeting was to answer user-submitted questions, and we also went off on some interesting tangents. The purpose of this meeting is better organizing and collecting of data as it relates to anomalous phenomena. It's a very big subject. You go around and introduce yourself, starting with the best Virginian. Hey, um, I'm the best Virginian. I'm an amateur West Virginia historian, a video maker, photographer, and uh, yep, that's about everything I do. Okay. Valerie? My name's Valerie Riley. I was on this podcast with other people. My main interest is within zoology. I fall on the skeptic side, but that's, uh, you know, to each their own. And Dave? My name's Dave. I'm uh, from Southwest Virginia. Primarily, I'm a researcher, uh, both books-wise and in the field. Um, primarily been more books than, than field lately, as uh, circumstances have not quite allowed anyone to quite go out. But yeah, I've worked on a, you know, a few podcasts, uh, some blogs, a uh, few books here and there. Um, my passion is just a little bit of everything. And uh, yeah, if it's interesting, I want to dig into it. Okay, so we got two West Virginians and then two Virginians. The subject is better organizing and collecting of data as it relates to anomalous phenomena. Uh, We have to keep in mind, of course, our current situation, but we can also think to the future for different times. What do you think that the the paranormal community and uh, researchers of Fortean phenomena can do moving forward? Like, what should be the big ideas to push the field further and continue this study? I mean, one thing that has, I've spoken to other people kind of in the past and what would thought would be a a good resource would be, you know, maybe a, almost a wiki of sorts to where you would have an online database that you could look up, uh, you know, based on keywords, um, you know, specific phenomenon, you know, how things interrelate, you know, you can go down, you know, the the path of UFOs, but if the UFO report has, you know, a Bigfoot sighting related to it, you could go down, you know, and another rabbit hole that way. But, you know, just being able to to create an online database where all the reports are are connected, you know, be a key one like that, which would make it something that people could easily, you know, reference or tap into as they're looking for various forms of information. Yeah, I I had um, the Mothman wiki was one of the first things I started working on when I got interested in this stuff back in 2016. I think I might have moved past the idea of a wiki at this point, but there definitely needs to be some kind of database. I don't know if it would need to be connected in that way. Um, I sort of uh, got over this whole idea of linking everything between, and now I really, what I want is just like data sheets of things that just go straight down the line of like, uh, chronologically listed sightings of any and all kinds. The most important stuff is the the sighting data. But I know every paranormal investigator, that's the thing they dream about. Like something I've, I've been hearing the, the entire time I've been researching this is everyone talks about, oh man, what if we had this big database? But I haven't really seen much effort in going towards that actual goal. The closest I've seen is uh, Albert Rosales has this... A book series called Humanoid Encounters, and before that it was a website, and it is chronological and goes down the sighting data, and it's done in this certain format, which is um, reminiscent of another researcher's format, which is called the Humcat, or the Humanoid Catalog, from David Webb, who was like, he wrote for Flying Saucer Review, and he was part of J. Allen Hynek's UFO group. And those are the closest I've seen is people who catalog like humanoid encounters or like close encounters of the third kind. David Webb was doing that in the 70s. Albert Rosales was doing that in the 2010s. So that's like a recent thing. You know, it still has, still leaves some to be desired. The sources aren't perfect and it is just like one person's, um, right. one person's database. And you think we'd be, you know, further along with um, a study like this. Because we're in a, a multi-generational study. This kind of research has been going on at least since 1919 with Charles Fort. Go over to Valerie now. Could You could join on this. What, what do you think should be an idea to move this field further? What, like if you were in charge of the, the Fortean 
field for a day, what would you be like, this is the thing that needs to happen? I'm actually going to take a different perspective. And I personally feel that it would be a collaborative effort, everyone that's in this field. Do you have a uh, push to talk on or something? Like he's cutting in and out. I should, like, an automatic here. I mean, like, every other word that you're saying, I can't hear. Okay, could you, like, restart your mic or something? Or maybe... Yeah, that, that? yeah, that's what I was going to do. Let me, um... Um, best Virginian, I know that you focus more on history and photography and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but I know you also go into folklore. Um, yes. do you have any ideas about better ways that we could, uh, organize and collaborate and collect this kind of data, like folklore? Um, I think generally there are some other projects. I know the Library of Congress has a veterans oral history project where different veterans, um, can submit uh, recordings about their time um, spent in different theaters of war. This project was started, I think, in 2000 or 2001, uh, right whenever, I mean, we started losing a lot of World War I veterans and a lot of stories that they had. Uh, they kind of started this effort to try and collect as many of them as possible. Um, so I think some way of getting individuals to submit um, their accounts, their stories, so that they can be um, reviewed but also shared would be very important and very useful. I know that you're a big fan of Ruth Ann music and uh, books like the, the Telltale Lilac Bush. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any, like, have you seen any folklorists like that in West Virginia that you think is the, the modern equivalent Modern equivalent, not really. Um, I, I know that there is some work being done, especially by Fairmont State University. Uh, I believe, I'll definitely share the article, um, several years ago they actually went through the Fairmont State uh, Folk Life Library that houses a lot of Ruth Ann Music's collective works. And I think they estimated there was enough to write five or six more books. But as far as I know, those projects have not been made uh, public. And I do not know the status of them, which is kind of unfortunate. The way that was done is she had a classroom and she kind of collected down their family stories and things like that. And that's where one of the earliest reports of the white thing, uh, 1920s, I believe, that's one of the first reports does that come from is just someone's family story. Mm -hmm. So if we had something like that in modern days, that would be really good. Um, the only thing that I've seen that's any anywhere close to that is these kinds of websites where they allow a user to submit a story and i don't think that's the same you know you, you probably won't get the same level of quality there so i'm trying to think of different ways that you could get the the witness or the you know the data about the folklore uh, i guess other than just driving around interviewing people or uh, loading up a voice call there's also projects like i don't know if you've ever listened to the inside appalachia uh podcast but occasionally they do especially around october um they will actually go out and collect ghost stories and other paranormal accounts from people and i believe they have gone to some of the uh festivals and things like the Mothman Festival. Um, I know last year they did one on the Harper's Ferry Haunted Tours that was really interesting lesson. Mm -hmm. um, I also see the occasional like um, ghost story hotline or something like that where people set up a 1-800 number and they you know people call them and they record their stories of uh, ghosts and Sasquatch and other things like that. I think it's also important uh, not to dismiss other fields of um, paranormal activity. I know it seems like this group, everyone's kind of interested in everything. I believe it was in uh, West Virginia UFOs where the author talks about how cryptid hunters will oftentimes report anomalous light activity in the sky or like poltergeist-like activity, but they often dismiss it because it doesn't fall into their specific field. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to kind of take everything in, even the little bits that you might not think associate directly to what you're interested in. 
Yeah, definitely. That's the um, the whole interconnected, uh, intersectional aspect of the paranormal that authors like John Heal and Jacques Vallée wrote about. And mm -hmm. uh, the book you're referencing is West Virginia UFOs, Close Encounters in the Mountain State by Bob Teets. Yes. Um, yeah, I do see hotlines and stuff like that where it's just like a general 40 in hotline or a general investigator hotline where it's like, call us with your UFO sightings, your ghost stories and your Sasquatch stories. What those end up doing is people just kind of collect those and put those in their own personal archives. A lot of researchers I find are very solitary. They don't actually collaborate much. They collect these stories, they print them off, they put them in their folders, they go through books and they find stories and do the same sort of thing. But then they just kind of sit there in their folders. I don't really feel that's the most efficient way of doing things really with like when you have 50 different hotlines and 50 different researchers and they're not sharing notes and they probably don't even know each other exist. So there has to be a better way to collaborate and organize and um, extract the data and get that kind of input in a way that it's not redundant and going to different investigators who, you know, are all trying to scoop each other on some story or whatever. There has to be um, a more efficient way to do that, I would feel, uh, you know, especially people telling stories this for this long, like going back to 1947 with UFOs, you think by now we'd have our act together. We'd say, okay, there's a UFO sighting. Here's where you go. Here's what you do. And there are some of the, the big UFO groups, but, you know, some of those are not the most quality. And even then there's like four or five of the big groups and they're not exactly forthcoming with their data and some of them are not exactly the most trustworthy. So there has to be some sort of from the bottom up push to document stories like that, you know, what are anomalous stories and also folklore. There, there are folklorists, you know, who kind of go to college and get their degree and things like that. And they collect their, their stories in the books. Um, and I think Ruth Ann Music is one of the best examples of that. There's so many stories packed in those books. And if you read those books, the books are just stories with very little commentary. So those are the kind of books that I love to see from folklorists. Um, mm -hmm. They end up in every bibliography for years and years to come. Even then, that's a classroom and a teacher. If there was a big network of folklorists, we would have a really good understanding of sort of Appalachian folklore. And we could, uh, you know, compare and contrast and connect the dots and say, okay, this story pops up here and also here. And this same motif and same trend repeats here, 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 you know, like I feel collaboration is the way to finally be able to put some of this together and either solve mysteries, understand anomalies, or at least understand better the culture and the folklore of these stories, even if there's nothing to them overall. Okay, Valerie, have you uh, fixed your mic by now? Yeah, it should be fixed now. Hopefully you can hear me just a little bit better. Okay. So, yeah. It, so were you uh, hearing the conversation we were having there? Yeah, so, I mean, I fully and completely agree with you on that. Like, it does make a lot more sense to kind of have everything be interconnected instead of everything is just compartmentalized into, like, just these, like, little groups and mm -hmm. everything's, like, hit and miss. But I also feel that it's really important that, and this is probably the skeptic in, in me coming out, I personally feel so that it's pretty important that you know, as researchers, as trying to investigate and learn and try to see what's out there, is that it's okay to be wrong sometimes. And I, I sometimes I've seen people get really married to an idea and they will do everything in their power to just try to twist it and make it true. And like, I, me personally, I've always been one to just want to get down to the facts, like what actually happened document properly and whether that's using video and uploading it to youtube and start making a network in that fashion or what some of the other people said making a wiki even though it's may may not be the best way to do it uh, as long as it's documented as long as everything is we continue to gather this data and we continue to look for what's actually happening and break it down piece by piece in that fashion, if that makes any sense. When you collect these sort of stories, you're bound to collect stories that are outright hoaxes and then stories that are just storytelling with no truth behind them. Um, it's important to mark those as such and learn from those as well. Well, you said there are some people get married to a certain idea 
I think that's a problem that people have because there'll be a sighting or a story and it'll be a really good story. It'll be a really compelling story. But then the, you know, the, the cracks in it will start to show. The seams will start to, to give way and they'll kind of ignore those because like, no, it's such a cool image. It's such a cool idea. They want to stick to it. And the other problem is sometimes they're like, oh, this is a really marketable story. This one gets a lot of clicks on their website. And that's a, oh, a yeah. big, that's a big problem that, you know, needs to be addressed and, you know, needs to be done away with, I feel, is the entertainment push of the paranormal and the broader uh, 40 and researchers is they're trying to be entertainers as well. And that gets in the way. So you got to get in the same way people talk about getting money out of politics. You got to get the money out of the paranormal. That shouldn't be a, a driving factor. Just having a website with like a contact or an, an open email, that obviously brings problems to where you don't know if the person you're talking to actually exists, if they live where they say they, they live, if they're not the same person who sent you a sighting that you got last week. So you do have to have quality control and you do have to, you know, actually investigate these claims. You have to take every single thing that comes in as a claim. That's what the classic Fordians do. But I think the better sightings are the ones that come from people face to face, you know, something we can't do right now. But that's how the old school people did it. They would travel across America, you know, in a rented car with a tape recorder, show up in your town and then interview people in their homes, slap a tape recorder down the table in front of them, hit the record button and start talking to them about UFOs and all that. But, you know, there has to be a more technologically advanced way of doing that. You think we could use the internet and this instantaneous communication we have to more quickly and efficiently do this. But I don't know, maybe the old ways are the best ways when it comes to getting data. I mean, I, I know that I trust a story more if I can hear the witness talking and especially if there is a video and I can see them telling the story. Um, not too long ago, I interviewed Ryan and Carly and Carly had claimed to have seen this bizarre salamander-like creature in Ohio. I feel that that was a good way of collecting that sighting data as opposed to, you know, if I would have gotten it just from an email and couldn't talk to them, I would be more suspicious of it. I couldn't ask them the proper questions. I couldn't have that back and forth. So the interview is a tried and true method of extracting data. And through voice call, you can do that. But then again, do you just wait around for someone in the Discord to happen to know somebody or to pop in and say, hey, I saw this? There has to be a better way to get this data. I mean, you know, other than just doing what Ruth Ann Music did and assembling a group of people and asking them their stories, because everyone has stories. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you on that one. I really do feel as though that the old way probably is going to be the best way in this type of situation. And as much as it's painful to hear that, especially when we've got everything like video chat and Discord and Zoom meetings and everything else, is that... Because you've got people that are just so willing to either sell a story or they're trying to fabricate something out of thin air. And when you're face to face with someone, you know, you can look them in the eyes and tell either they're being dead serious. They'll, they'll tell you, you know, you can go ahead and take that to the bank or if they're being disingenuous. Now, it's a lot more time consuming to do that. Uh, I mean, one of the suggestions that could possibly come about is, you know, if there was some sort of YouTube channel where like everything would be, you know, documented in that fashion. You see a rise in the unnamed witness in modern times because people don't want to put their names out there and stuff. There was that as well back in the day, but I think there's it's more so now. But yeah, I agree. Probably the best way to do things are, are the tried and true interview method. Although, you know, voice call and video chat is a way that you could work around that without having to drive to someone's house and, you know, sit at their kitchen table. So how do you feel then we collect this data? Just um, wait for things like that to pop up in the Discord, people who know something. Wait for news stories. Because, uh, for example, let's say there's a Sasquatch sighting in your area and you read it in the news. By the time you read that in the news, that guy has probably been interviewed 20, 30 times, you know, and then you have to pop up and say, hey, can I interview you again? Ends up being redundant and ends up not very efficient. But I, I guess that's the, the best way to do it is to wait for a news story or 
to wait for a sighting to come to you, sending up an email that's just a broad email that you know you could wade through is probably good. And just keeping your, your ear to the ground is probably another good thing to do. But what, what do you guys think is a good method of finding a story and finding the data to extract? Tentatively, I would think, um, you know, this probably should have been rolled in with my original you know, spiel, but you know, running something kind of like a forum, which is much more broadly open to the public. Not many people, you know, know of the Discord yet, but you put out something where it's a forum that says, hey, this is focused on things happening in the Appalachian Mountains. And, you know, come tell us your story and then you can have particular sections within that forum of, hey, you know, tell me of cryptid sightings you may have or, you know, strange lights or, you know, just how you got the channels broken up here and Discord. You could have a forum for each one of those all within a singular web page. And when people document stuff or submit a story, if it's something that looks like it's it's got a grain of truth to it or piques your interest, you can follow up with the person that submitted it and see if they had agreed to an interview. Yeah, there could be a... Um maybe a more open witness discord because the discord we're in right now is like for the investigators. Carly came in because she was the wife of someone who was already here, who was already an investigator. And, you know, she joined because she also is interested enough to be a researcher, but not every witness is a researcher, of course. So maybe there should be a secondary discord that doesn't need an invite, that is just open, that, you know, people can kind of funnel into. So, you know, kind of piggybacking off of that, something that I've toyed with the idea, though I've kind of never moved forward with it, it was always just an idea, is setting up some sort of non-profit organization. However, I don't know if that's been done before, but I kind of feel like it should have been. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a, a list of some different uh, organizations that have been set up over time. And, you know, some of them are uh, where they kind of just, you know, use the funds to continue to meet and do things like that. Yeah. And I, and that was something that I was kind of thinking about, because if you set up if there was like a nonprofit organization and just made people feel comfortable enough to come forward with their story and just start organizing data in that fashion and, you know, like I said, I think one of the, the main problems when it comes to finding legitimate stories is that perception that other people have is that like, well, if I tell them this story that I saw a UFO or something else of that nature, when the reality is, you know, that everything should be taken seriously up to a point, I really feel as though that that's the reason why we don't hear more stories from people is because they're scared, they're intimidated by that perception of what's going to, how are people going to see me? You know, if I, if my name gets out there and I saw X, Y, Z or whatever, and just kind of start to vet people in that fashion, trying to understand their story and just trying to, you know, document what they're saying instead of just dismissing it outright. And that's been a, a problem since all the way back in the forties when it was kind of like pulp entertainment all the way till now when it's, uh, seeped into more mainstream entertainment, there's always been that problem of this being used as entertainment. There has to be a, a line of where it's more informative and uh, more of a documentary than just, you know, spooky stories. But okay, one of the um, first organizations I have actually written out here is the um, 1862, and it's the Ghost Club. It was founded in London, considered the oldest organization dedicated to the investigation of ghosts and hauntings. And um, it had some prominent poets that were a part of it, and it's reportedly still active. But some of these organizations are very, um, you know, they're very exclusive and closed in, and you can't really, like, they're not going to share with you all their documents. Um, then there is the Society for Psychical Research. That's one of the, probably the, one of the oldest um, psychic-based studies. That's also in uh, the United Kingdom in 1882, and that's reportedly still active. And there's also the American uh, Society for Psychical Research and um, the National Laboratory for Psychical Research. In 1927, there's the Fairy Investigation Society, and that was, you know, very much the same as the ghost stories, but with fairy sightings and fairy stories. And the first that would um, fall in line with what we do, I think, the most would be the Fortean Society, and that was founded in New York in 1931 by friends of Charles Fort. A lot of these kind of organizations, they go for a while, and they're not organized very well, or they, you know, just happens that they fall apart. And that's one of them that fell apart, and it went inactive in 1959. 
And it would seem that the reason it went inactive is because it was very based on the leader there. And that's a, a trend I see popping up in a lot of these things. These groups kind of become just very associated with like one head figure. And then that head figure dies and they can't keep it going. So you guys have anything to say on that idea? No, I, I, I can definitely see that trend and having maybe an actual... I don't want to say council is not the right word for it, but uh, some kind of administrative group to where it's not all reliant upon one figurehead might give the opportunity to one, you know, kind of help delegate tasks and, and duties and give, you know, multiple um, places for people to reach out to, you know, versus everyone trying to run to the same, you know, point man for approval for this or an opinion on that. You know, if you've got a, a group of people that are acting in that stead, that would give it, a much broader spe uh, spectrum for people to reach out to. Mm -hmm. And there was a time in America where every small town, it seems, had a UFO club. And never once did that, you know, sort of coalesce into a big network of UFO clubs. They kind of just stayed as little tiny UFO clubs. And then eventually, you know, time went on, they got bored of the subject or the, you know, organizing broke down or the leader uh, either died or quit the, the field. And it just kind of went away, tossed their files in the garbage, or sold them to other groups. There was no structure, so it's a shame that there, that wasn't better organized. And I think that that's what we need to try to do, is to pick up where some of those groups left off and fill in some of those roles and, you know, organize better with the understanding that this is a multi-generational study. You know, people have been studying this since the 1800s, since Charles Fort in 1919. And, you know, we're probably not going to solve any of these mysteries in our lifetime. So we need to properly archive and be able to pass the torch to the next generation and, you know, not be so individually based. Because I think a lot of people, they think they can solve the mysteries of the universe on their own. And, you know, they're just one person and they just got one life. And that's not really how that works. You got to have um, look to the people around you and then look to the future as well, because... I think what we really do here is we collect puzzle pieces that maybe someone in the future will one day put together. But for the time being, we just collect the, the, the data and archive it. We are kind of starting to see, especially here in West Virginia, um, like you said, with at one point, every little town kind of had their own uh, UFO club. I think we are starting to see a lot of communities um, kind of embrace paranormal and dark tourism. Um, for example, Moundsville and uh, McMacken have a very um, strong paranormal community. Uh, Weston, uh, Flatwoods, Harpers Ferry, Parkersburg, Point Pleasant, obviously. They all have their own individual little, very dedicated uh, paranormal researchers. But again, there's not a whole lot of communication in between them, and there's not a whole lot of um, interaction between them. And actually, that might work as far as a way of contacting people for you know their stories. I think they'd be more forthcoming if you kind of came to them in their own element. You know, if you just try contacting someone about an account they had versus if you would go to you know, the trains Allegheny during peak tourism season and just say, you know, if you have any accounts that you'd like to talk about, um, contact such and such, this and that number, or email address or whatever. I, I think they'd be a lot more forthcoming if they knew there were groups out there interested in hearing their stories. Yeah, I would say the, um, the modern equivalent of the American UFO Club is probably the ghost team or the, um, the Facebook group, or the Discord, like, you know, Sasquatch teams as well. They have, like, a mm -hmm. Facebook group, and then they go out in the woods on the weekends when they can, and they kind of just try to have a sighting where they look around for footprints, things like that. Someone brought it up. I forget if it was Dave or... But I think that a lot of these groups seem like they become really honed in on one idea, and they just kind of, like, you know, brush off anything else that might happen that is outside of the realm of what they're interested in and, you know, kind of trying to 
collect all of it and bring it together into one harmonious kind of umbrella, I think that would be a lot more enriching to the field in, instead of just trying to brush it off or saying, well, that's not my interest. Or if you have someone who has been around Flatwoods and has seen, you know, have spoken to a lot of the eyewitnesses to not just like peter off and say, well, you know, that's in Point Pleasant. That's not in Flatwoods. And just kind of just try to understand both sides of the, the coin and just try to look at everything all together and, you know, pull in as much data as you can because never hurts to learn about new things, about new areas. And something that could help you on one investigation could prove to be a very valuable asset on the next investigation or maybe even a previous one. Yeah, I think that um, what those groups have to offer most is um, like what Best Virginian would say on there is a connection to the individual people so that if a sighting happens or if something weird's going on, you can hear sort of through the grapevine by being connected with those people and making contacts, I guess is the word. You know, you can be more in with the community and hear when something goes on. I don't see a lot of... Um, you know, note sharing or sort of people who have data sheets. The, the more archivist people, they have folders of signing data, which is why I think services like Google Docs and, of course, websites and blogs can be useful to digitally archive that data so that it's more accessible uh, for sharing and things like that. There is an exclusivity thing <clears throat> where, like, sometimes someone will uh, say, you can't research this story and they want to write a book about it and all that sort of thing. And you have to go through them. Turning the clock way back to, you know, when Ghost Hunters was first coming on the Sci-Fi Channel and was peaking in popularity that a lot of these groups were built and maintained and held on to their stuff due to territorialness. They, they wanted exclusivity. They thought they were going to be the next big thing. And truly, you know, that's uh, there was a, a local group here that got their hands on a, you know, significant historical site and signed a rights agreement with the owner preventing any other group from ever going to investigate and you know fortunately that kind of you know popularity of those shows has, has waned somewhat over the years and people have opened up more so i mean it might be more approachable these days than it was say 10 years ago but yeah that's that's where a lot of that stemmed from yeah that happens with um haunted items that get put behind glass and no one can ever go research anything to do with them. And that happens with properties. Um, there are some places that are reportedly haunted and the owner kind of seals it off. Some of that is like the owner doesn't care about paranormal stuff. So there's that problem as well. I, I think a lot of these organizations also view it as a business. They're not looking to solve the world's mysteries. They're not looking to give you any of their data. They view it as gold. That kind of uh, way of thinking poisons everything. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you start messing with their paycheck, they're uh, they're going to push back. So. Yeah, one of the the great classic UFO clubs I think is really cool is uh, APRO by Carol Rolenzes. That was the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, and that was it. Ran from 1952 to 1988, and it was very grassroots individual UFO club, and it was in Arizona. But when she passed away, the group kind of fell apart. So that's one of the archetypal examples of a UFO club is they do great work. They're all, you know, grassroots. Every single person is just a, a, a civilian saucer seeker. And then eventually it just falls apart. And then, you know, you can never get any of those files. Yeah, it's just like everything gets dropped at that point. And it's like, well, I guess that was that was fun. Or, you know, if someone can't make a living off of it, I guess that's when that research just kind of stops. Um, yeah, there's also like a few horror stories about uh, individual investigators who die and their uh, archives get thrown in the trash, you know, and just there goes their life's work. So there needs to be some way to save a lot of these archives and notes that these investigators have. And occasionally someone will buy them and do good things with them or put them in a museum, or put them in a library, and they're open to the public. Um, but then occasionally, they just disappear. You don't know what happens to them. They get thrown away, or someone buys them, and for whatever reason, leaves them locked away in their storage, and you never get to see what any of those 
letters, correspondence, or archives were all about. Yeah, that that's really unfortunate. And, you know, I think it would be wonderful if there, you know, I mean, if there was like an organization that some that you could just, you know, donate these findings. Like if I know that there's probably a lot of people that come across like their mother or father's work and, you know, all that documentation. And you could just say, hey, listen, if you guys come and get it, you can have it. And, you know, just have it get scanned and, like you said, uploaded to Google Docs or, you know, just have it as a reference to point back at something and kind of try to correlate data in that fashion. Yeah. And then also like public domain archive websites and things like that, like archive.org or any kind of thing where they allow you to just put something there as long as it's public domain. But yeah, I, I think about that sometimes. Like if you ever went to a uh, a garage sale or a flea market and you stumble across a box full of some kind of, uh, you know, some Fordian archive, that, that would be crazy. Um, some of this stuff is interesting, just the fanzines or like the magazines and newsletters of the time, these um, fan-made stuff like that. Some of that stuff is, uh, even that's just interesting because that, if someone has a subscription to that, they're probably like one of 20 people who had a subscription to that and then you can see like, oh, what UFO sightings were big at the time and what was the, the scene like at the time, you know? And so that stuff's stuff that needs to be reprinted and, you know, efficiently put out to the, the public, like so they can dig through all that. Um, one thing I was going to say, the International Fordian Organization, or INFO, they acquired the archives and files of the original Fordian Society. And they founded in 1961 and they're reportedly still active. You never really know with some of these uh, groups because you don't see them very much, but they're reportedly still active. There needs to be an organization like this that just allows for files to come in that is, you know, upfront about the fact that they're going to keep them and they're going to archive them and they're going to let the public uh, peruse them or they're going to digitize them or something. Because, you know, this kind of structureless, uh, boy, I hope it gets saved type mentality is really not going to do well if we continue on this way. I think people are aware now when they're reading through books from the 30s and reading through books from the 70s, I think people are aware now, at least, that this is a multi-generational study. And I'm hoping that people will take that to heart and say, okay, I should archive what I'm doing right now, because what I'm doing now, maybe someone in the future will need as well. So we need to work on that sort of torch passing, archive, document everything kind of mentality, because if you don't take that seriously, you don't archive it, it won't be there. Yeah, if you don't uh, preserve it and share it, you're ultimately just going to lose it. I mean, this goes all the way back to the Library of Alexandria and just all the data that was destroyed during the fire of it, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. It's definitely important to uh, not just copy it, but also share and distribute it. So if one person's uh, system or database gets wiped, it's not just all gone forever. Because, you know, this is stuff that people spend their their whole lives doing. And it's a shame to see that either go away or be put behind a paywall. Yeah, that's probably the worst, is just putting everything behind a paywall. Don't forget, too, you need backups of backups. You know, I've seen so many people rely on one single hard drive, and the the wonderful thing about hard drives is that they have a failure rate of 100%. It's going to fail. It's just, you know, a matter of, when will it fail so i you know make sure you back it up to the cloud make sure you put in google docs make sure you try to put in as many places as you possibly can i I find it amazing how many ufo clubs there were there's um the international flying saucer bureau which ran from 1952 to 1953 that's the one that albert bender ran that dissolved supposedly because the men in black there's uh nicap which is the national investigation committee of aerial phenomena that was founded by Donald Kehoe in 1956, and it became defunct in 1980. There is uh, 1950s, there's a group called Saucers that was founded by James Mosley, and it's uh, S-A-U-C-E-R-S as like an acronym. It stands for Saucers and Unexplained Celestial Events Research Society. So it's some very kooky sort of um, names. I love that they all go for acronyms. There's uh, the Loch Ness Monster Phenomena Investigation Bureau that was founded in the UK in 1962. Ted Holliday was a part of that one. Uh, That one ran from 1962 to 1972. Roger Patterson, the guy who filmed the Patterson-Gimlin film, 
he had a research society called the Abominable Snowman Club of America. And that was founded in 1966 and then became defunct at some point. Then a really good group is 1973 uh, and reportedly still active is the Center for UFO Studies. And that was founded by J. Allen Hynek. And uh, J. Allen Hynek in the 70s did his best work. He did some really good work there when he became a civilian saucer seeker. And, you know, I really like that kind of stuff. Like I said, I, I love APRO. And I like the later works uh, in the 70s of Jalen Hynek, and I just love the grassroots UFO stuff, like the UFO clubs, because, you know, they weren't, you know, they weren't Project Blue Book, you know, they weren't working with the government, they were just people who were passionate, who wanted to know what was going on, and so they set up a club right alongside their science fiction club, you know, they'd meet in the library or whatever, and they'd have their flying saucer club. Uh, John Keel also had the New York Fortean Society in 1984 to 1989. And uh, the reason that one went defunct is because he ran out of money. So that's another problem, is people who are very passionate, who have a lot to give, and who want to uh, archive, document, and organize, you know, they don't have a lot of money. So they kind of have to ask for donations or something like that, and then they use that money to rent out a library or to print off newsletters and things like that. These newsletters were often just Xerox things, you know, and they were sent out to people in the mail. They'd ask you for your address and they'd send it to you in the mail. So, yeah, that whole art style, I, I think, has probably uh, gone the way of the dinosaurs. The um, paper fanzine that they used to give out at UFO conventions and advertise and, you know, people would subscribe to. It's, it's great when you can find reprints of those because they're so fascinating and they're so cool just to think that someone made that and they sent it out to people. Uh, it, it's good to learn from the the people who came before you, from the, the greats and things like that, and see what they did and kind of learn from it. You don't have to copy it exactly, and you certainly don't have to enshrine any of these people, but you can learn from some of what they did. And so from what I've seen, the UFO crowd, they had their, their disparate UFO clubs, which unfortunately didn't network together very well and probably spent most of their time fighting, you know, the different theories and stuff and different organizations that didn't like each other for whatever reason. They also documented their stuff, archived it. Some of them archived it quite well and passed it along. Some of them threw it away. It newsletters, convention appearances, and the group itself. That's how the, the whole UFO community, the flying saucer subculture, that's how it, you know, that's how it lived back in the day. As well as, you know, trying to get put in magazines, which, you know, could be quite difficult unless it's like a UFO magazine. Um, Fate magazine did really well to help foster that community back in the day with um, uh, Ray Palmer. A lot of stories were only published because Ray Palmer was willing to put them in the pages of Fate magazine. So there's that. Honestly, I feel like one of the great first steps that we're taking here is that we're, we're starting to collect this information. And what I do like about this Discord channel is that we've got a mixture of a little bit of everything, you know, everything from ghosts, UFOs, cryptozoology, you know, it's got, you know, it seems like it's run the full gambit, you know, of just every single category. And I mean, honestly, I'm really thrilled that, you know, that we can kind of start piecing all of this together. Yeah, definitely. Because there are some people who, if they hear someone tell them that they saw a UFO and a Sasquatch, they'll just mark down the Sasquatch or they'll just mark down the UFO. But if someone told me that story, I would mark down both of them. And then I would go on to ask them you know, every question I could think of about what other things have happened in their lives. Because, you know, I'm interested in the anomalous. I'm interested in the mystery. So it doesn't matter what it is. If it's mysterious, I want to know about it. So is there um, specific cases that, like any witnesses you've talked to or specific cases you've investigated, Valerie? Uh, well, so when I was, you know, looking into the Mothman, and obviously I don't live in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. I'm nowhere near there. I've only been able to go down there just a few handful of times. But um, yeah, I mean, I was able to talk to a lot of the, the locals there. Um, fortunately, I was able to talk to Linda Scarberry and, you know, just kind of happened in like a flash because I didn't anticipate meeting her. Uh, you know, I was actually just in, in that, you know, the, the Harris Steakhouse. And so like it, it happened so quickly and i i wish i had like a recording device i would to kind of help me collect that data but it was just it it happened in a blink of an eye when i was talking to her and everything so i i think 
it's pretty important to also be cognizant of your surroundings because if there was one time that I could have had a voice recorder, it would have been that time. One thing I wanted to bring up is most of this study is based on uh, collecting of an anecdote, collecting of uh, witness testimony. You think at this point we'd have some kind of standardized way of interviewing witnesses. We'd have some kind of book Here's how to research UFOs. Here's how to um, here's how to interview a paranormal witness. Here's how to interview a Fortean witness. And that's something that you don't really see very much is like pamphlets or books about how to interview a witness. I mean, I guess you could look up like police procedure or things like that, or how you introduce an entertainment interview for like um, an author or a musician or something like that. Folklorists, you know, have a certain way they go about it. But a lot of people who are doing this, it all comes down to witness testimony, and the people who are interviewing them are amateurs. So our entire field is based on amateur interviews, and you think that we would really try to standardize that and improve the quality of that. We'd put out some kind of helpful guide, because if you help people do that better, you improve the research, and if the research improves, that helps you. But I guess, you know, maybe that's not seen that way, or it's not recognized as very important. Um, but that's something I would love to sort of figure out how to, you know, how to instruct people to do. Because if, if people are out there interviewing, I want them to be doing it the best way possible so that the data will be the best. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just kind of making everything into a standard procedure. And obviously, things are going to be different with every person and the questions may be different and everything. But I do agree with, with you on that perspective is just trying to make sure that there's a nice formula for a guideline in order to try and make everything a little bit more harmonious in trying to like ask the right questions and trying to get down to the the essentials of what you're trying to get from that person whether it be you know that they saw mothman or whether it be uh the loveland frog people i think that's what it was but or you know anything of that nature, there just needs to be certain beats that need to be hit. Mm -hmm. We need to give people more resources. I think that's something that we're missing out on is something that everyone recognizes, oh yeah, that is the best way to do it so that we can be on the same page in terms of quality and up the quality. And um, that's something I don't see enough attention being paid to is open resources and like free resources and things like that. Not everyone's going to have a Fortean library or like bookshelves full of books in their home. We can't expect everyone to build a Fortean library in their home. So we need some kind of free resources and things that people can learn from that, you know, are just out there. Okay, um, David, is, is there any um, uh, strange case that you've worked on or any kind of close encounter uh, story you've interviewed a witness about that you could talk about? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the most recent case I worked on was um, early fall. I went and helped a, a friend of mine with a family uh, suffering through an oppression at their house in Maryland. Um, basically, it was a, a mother, father, um, two boys, and a girl that lived at, her ha at their house due to um, family matters of her own where she couldn't live at her own house. And there seemed to be uh, a lot of issues that they were having with uh, um, visitations at night, visitations in dream states, visitations, um, you know, when they were walking the property, they would see, you know, cloaked figures in the woods. Um, they had several animal mutilations on their farm. Uh, there was just, you know, a whole slew of just mixed activity going on. And honestly, you know, they were... They, they felt that their family was at a breaking point. If something didn't happen, they were going to have to, to pull up stakes and, and get out. And even then, you know, that, that, as you know, that's not a guarantee that that's going to solve any of the, you know, kind of issues when you're experiencing something like that. Um, and, you know, and that's one of those situations where, you know, you, we, we pulled each individual family member, interviewed them, you know, separately. And then, you know, we would pull them together as a group talk to them as a group, you know, one of the main things about interviewing them separately is, you know, when they're both talking about, hey, you know, we saw this particular figure that likes to walk through her hallway and into her son's room, is making sure that their descriptions of said figure all line up. 
because if one guy's saying, yeah, it's eight foot tall with red eyes, and the other one's like, oh, it's, you know, about four foot tall and has green eyes. Well, you know, that, that, that something's not lining up, but you know, if everything was hitting, you know, all the marks consistently and, you know, and this, this turned out to be a, a serious enough case where we pulled in a, a Catholic priest. He came in, he did a blessing on the home. We helped out the family. The, uh, did a blessing on the family. Um, so far we've not seen any major reoccurrence. I mean, they still have some minor activity at the house with, uh, you know, things moving around and things like that. But we do think that there was, other issues other than the oppressive entities that were at their house. I mean, we, their father, we think, you know, has not left the home yet. And he is part of the, the activity that they were witnessing, but he wasn't the oppressive force. So, I mean, that was, yeah, probably the most recent, you know, I guess a major thing that we have, I've worked on in the past uh, six months or so. Are, are you continuing to do independent sort of investigations in, in the meantime? Is that what you've been doing lately? Uh, here recently, uh, I actually spent a lot of my time focusing on spirit possession and attachment. Yeah, so and like residential? It's, oh, just, uh, you know, on, on people and hopefully going to get back in the field soon. Just, yeah, okay. just kind of waiting for uh, things to warm back up and, and things to mellow out a little bit. Yeah. So how, how are you, um, documenting the, the cases that you work on currently? Like where are you putting the, the data? Uh, I, I keep a notebook. Okay. Um, I, I basically jot down the who, what, wins, where's, and why's, and then, you know, any information given to me by the, the particular person I talk to, you know, I keep, keep notes on those conversations. Um, we also, uh, I don't have them in my possession, but the gentleman I was helping with, we have the audio recordings of each interview as well. So, Okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I know that you previously worked with uh, Supernatural Media, that's a, a channel that I, I looked at. How many uh, organizations or groups have you been a part of? Uh, I would say uh, four you know, over the, the past. Good Lord, how many years have I been doing this? <laughs> um, but I, I initially started a, a group um, way back uh, in the, or I guess you'd say early 2000s, and that kind of, petered out because I just I couldn't find anyone to gain interest and in, in doing anything and then of course the shows came out and then I bumped into the guys at Supernatural Media we seemed to hit it off and we you know I ran with them for uh, a good number of years until they they ran into the same issue that um, we were speaking about earlier a lot of everything with them uh, was based upon the figureheads of the group and for various reasons they each had to step away from doing any further research and at that point the the group dissolved so you know after that i uh started working with my friend patrick um who i mentioned patrick burke and i've been working with his spark team here for uh the past two years and i've been going with him to do uh field research mainly in maryland uh doing a lot of uh he does a lot of battlefield research uh battlefield um I say paranormal archaeology, uh, where he goes and we use tools like, uh, you know, the double blind ghost box method, or I, I can't remember what uh, the, the other name they, they, they call it by, just the, by the one that we called it for supernatural media. But um, we will use that and, you know, we'll have one person on the box with the headphones on and another person asking questions about various things that, that happened on a particular battlefield. Uh, you know, we went to Gettysburg for a good example. And we would talk about, all right, well, what general and, you know, companies were on this ridge up here? And, you know, if we could get the, the person with the headphones on to, to give a name or to give a company number or something like that, then, you know, we know that we can validate the information that was coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the double blind ghost box thing is, is pretty interesting because it, it's kind of like a proto Estes method. Um, I saw yeah. you guys have like a book that has that. That was um, something that, you know, I, I can't take any credit for it. I mean, this was uh, the gentleman that started the, the Supernatural Media kind of birthed the idea. And I was fortunately, uh, you know, happened to be in the right place at the right time and got to work with them when they were early, beginning the early testing of it. But yeah, it's just the concept of, 
you've got the ghost box that most people are familiar with where you run through the the series of channels you know on a scan and you pick up bits of words here and there or you know you might hear something coming through the static and if you play that out in the open air that's something that you know if you're sitting in a room full of people and you say hey what color is the sky and you know everyone's expecting to hear blue. so if something comes through that's a, 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 a whatever everyone's going to jump to assume that's blue. Mm-hmm. but if you've got the the double blind ghost box kind of method going on and you've got one guy you know with the headphones on he's got it cranked up way loud he can't hear any of the questions and he's sitting across the room and you've got someone that goes hey what color is the sky and if that guy with the headphones on blurts out the word blue well then you know there's something actually talking through the box that's giving you know um, a meaningful answer back and you know that's the the kind of things that we would do when we were in the, the field testing it it's we would ask questions with known answers so that way you know before we go into anything speculative we could set a baseline of you know are we just getting a bunch of mumbo jumbo or are we actually getting legit answers before we go into asking you know things that might not be known stuff that might not be tracked in history so yeah, it's a really smart method. I think uh, it's probably the best way to do it. And that's what I've taken to is the only way that I use the spirit box is uh, doing that sort of double blind Estes method type thing. And I find that when you have the blindfold on and stuff, it, it's sort of like a, like psychic channeling in a way, yeah. uh, like the old school spiritualists did. Yeah. And yeah, the groups you've been in and the way you conduct your investigations is uh, a little bit different than the way I would do it. It's, a, it's more uh, religiously oriented, but as long as you get the, the data and the witness's story, you know, I would say whatever different framework or whatever different take that people have is, is fine. Like I'm, I'm fine with different speculation and different ways of viewing the world as long as the witness's words are properly recorded. And that seems to be yeah. when you said, uh, you said who, what, when, where, why. And that's kind of the, the journalistic, you know, like that's the code. That's the way you do things. So as long as you get the who, what, when, where, why, I'd say that's you're doing good work as long as you do that. Yeah, I mean, the, some of the groups I've worked with have had that uh, the, that particular religious slant on them. But, you know, a lot of the work I do with, with Patrick, you know, say that's has kind of gotten away from that. The only time really there is any kind of religious slant to that is when we come into situations like I was telling you about with the oppression and where we've got to call in um, a more, I guess you would say, spiritually backed a uh, person like a priest or something like that mm-hmm. so okay uh best virginian i know you focus more on history and photography and things like that have you ever interviewed a witness who's seen something bizarre like a ufo or a sasquatch or something like that i have not i have done more um trying to put actual geographical locations actual areas um to like a lot of the stories featured in the Ruth Ann music books. That's something I've enjoyed doing at, um, because if it's just a story in a book, it's hard, kind of hard for people to imagine the communities and the areas that those stories have come from. And then really in a lot of the cases, um, many of the stories came from immigrant communities. So in some cases I have been able to connect some of these stories to uh, the old world over to like Ireland and Britain and um, Eastern European countries where I think a lot of these stories actually originated from and then some of that folklore came to the mountain state from those regions. If you mm-hmm. want to know something about uh, a specific monster, it's always good to get in tune with the area and see like, okay, what kinds of people live here? What kinds of... Uh, events have happened here and uh that can really help inform that sort of thing Mm -hmm. yeah and i know that mapping out is something that a lot of people do when they get like the push pins and the boards and things like that and uh ivan sanderson way back in the day he said the best way to communicate this sort of stuff is through mapping that was his favorite method of conveying information when you look at it and you see where all the different stuff is coming from it starts to sort of make a little bit of sense and that's like the whole paranormal topography thing that people talk about and uh, like certain trends and locations and all that sort of thing that, you know, people can go a little wild with if they focus on it too much. But it's good to know, like, in relation where everything is. And I would say West Virginia's got a pretty good uh, overall spread of different monsters and high strangeness and close encounters and strange things. You know, you got Mothman there at the border of the Ohio River. And you got, um, you know, the Flatwoods monsters more in the center. Up at the top, you got... Um, 
you know, Moundsville, and then, you know, have Weston sort of uh, above Flatwoods, the stuff like the Apple Devils and the Grafton Monster and all that good stuff. I know a fellow researcher who is in northern West Virginia who does a lot of great archival stuff. His name is uh, Les O'Dell, and he runs West Virginia Cryptids and Strange Encounters. And I really like the, the stuff he does. There are a few very archival people. He's been in the Mothman Legacy. And so there are some, some great researchers out there as I look for, you know, not necessarily people who are making a big production, uh, but people who are like very folkloric sort of archival. That's the kind of stuff I think is the, the best way to do these sort of amateur folklorists. Because, you know, art is all fine and well and good. I like art, but it shouldn't be the main thrust. There has to be some kind of real research behind it. And when I see movies and like books written in novel format, I'm like, okay, this is good, but where is the actual documentary? Where is the informative work? You know, as uh, Sherlock Holmes says, data, 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 I can't make bricks without clay. Have you been in any other uh, groups or organizations other than AMS? They're best Virginian. I haven't. I've really, up until like two years ago, I really had no interest in even the uh, history side of things up until about two and a half years ago. So, Wasn't it uh, Fallout 76, you said, that sort of got you into making videos? I, I lost a bet and had to make a video on how West Virginia became a state, and then I just kind of stuck with it since then. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I really like your, your videos, the sort of uh, personable style, how you kind of just, it seems like you just turn on the camera, say a bunch of stuff, turn off the camera. It's very um, sort of quick and personable, and uh, I find myself making a lot of big, overly edited stuff that takes forever to make, but I really like that kind of style. It's my favorite kind of YouTube style, really, is that quick, almost vlog style where they just talk about a subject. It's something I've been, you know, working on trying to do more lately. So I really like the, those videos and when you kind of just show off the books and then talk about a specific subject, be it history or folklore. Um, you mentioned how West Virginia is sort of obsessed with tragedies, like that West Virginia books of tragedies. Uh, I mm -hmm. do see a lot of that sort of um, folk ballad type stuff. And I do see a lot of Irish influence on West Virginia and the way they view folklore and where a lot of the folklore is, you know, a lot of very uh, fairy stuff as well. Um, also, there's a lot of, especially in more of the central part of the state, a lot of banshee stories that have connections to um, Ireland, Scotland, and the UK. Yeah, there's um, a book called uh, The Cry of the Banshee by Susan Shepard. I got a lot of West Virginia books on my bookshelf. Mm -hmm. It was your, your most recent video, your 2020 in review. I think you mentioned something about like a photographer club or something like that. Or... I, I've uh, been interested in working with other people um, to kind of do different collaborative and uh, photography projects. Yeah, no, I've, I've never actually worked with any other groups of people. It's always, uh, since I got started, it's just always been me, except for um, I did a couple like sketch comedy uh stuff back in like high school back in the very very early days like before youtube even but yeah since then i really have just been doing my own own thing mm -hmm. I, I like your uh your videos on coal mining history and stuff like that as well mm -hmm. a lot of great history stuff something i'm also trying to go more towards is to do more history content you know put the historian back in the mothman historian uh, your other stuff on like how West Virginia became a state and all that sort of thing. You know, West Virginia has such a, a fascinating origin story. I was looking recently about how they had different names for what West Virginia could have been called. And one of them was uh, Kanawha, like Kanawha County. And I could just imagine people trying to pronounce that, that name if it was the state name. There, there was, um, if you actually read the big like name fight that they had uh, trying to figure out a name as soon as someone suggested Kana, someone immediately was like do you mean the county do you mean the river now we're also gonna have a state named after it and there were a couple guys that were just like i think we should keep virginia and uh people kind of protested that like why would we steal virginia's name it's like well they didn't want to be a part of the united states so they didn't come up with a new name for themselves and uh, yeah, it, it got really, 
really weird and petty, especially when we were first starting to separate from uh, Virginia. So do you ever get into any trouble about your name there uh, being the best Virginian? Yes and no. Uh, I, occasionally I will get followers um, that think I am uh, based around Virginia stuff. There was also a Western called the Virginia, the Virginian. And occasionally I'll just get spikes in traffic from people watching like best Western compilations. And then it will just recommend one of my videos right behind it for some reason um oop, i uh i'm i'm not the best of anything i'm just an average maybe slightly below average intelligence person from the better of the two virginias the best of the two virginias so that's where the name originated from <laughs> okay well we're, we're talking to two people here who are from the other virginia so i, I kind of wonder how they feel about that well, I know I'm going to try to best you and just call myself the better Virginian. <laughs> Have you been in any other organizations other than the Appalachian Mystery Society? Truth be told, uh, no. I've been trying to get back into kind of doing the field research type of thing. I know that for a very long time I was doing a lot of stuff independently. Admittedly, I've been basically an armchair skeptic for quite a while. The problem is, is trying to find people that are willing to go out and investigate this stuff, you know, just trying to find find more people, like-minded people to do investigations and collect this data and, you know, talk to people and everything like that. I know that I've been up to Gettysburg uh, a few times and, you know, they would do some of the, the haunted tours and kind of kitschy stuff, like some of them just seem like that they're just doing it you know that i would love to go out to you know sites and do investigations what whatever it may be and i know that my main interest is cryptozoology but i mean i'm always up for learning just trying to find truth and you know trying to get to the bottom of things yeah i know that you um seem to be interested more in the uh the more close encounter type monsters and the more high strangeness monsters as opposed to just uh, Sasquatch, because if you read a lot of the classic cryptozoologists, um, they're often very inspired by Ivan Sanderson. It's um, Sasquatch, Loch Ness monster, living dinosaurs, the what we think of now, uh, what people refer to as a cryptid. Uh, a lot of it comes from Close Encounters and UFOs and Fortians and things like that, like um, the Mothman being a, a UFO case, um, Loveland being the 1955 one being a UFO case, and a lot of these very strange creatures were only investigated by like the Fortians and the UFO crowd who were kind of venturing off just interested in oddities. A lot of the very serious cryptozoologists wouldn't give reports of a dog man or a winged being the time of day. So I think you can kind of thank the Fortians and the, the UFO crowd for a lot of the, the weirder of the quote unquote cryptids. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, I know that here in I mean, I'm from Northern Virginia, so the closest thing that, you know, I, I kind of jokingly gripe about it, but, you know, the closest thing that we have to something being exciting is uh, the Bunny Man Bridge. And it's like just some throwaway story, essentially. But, uh, you know, just trying to find out more about, you know, I wish there was more stuff in Northern Virginia, but it just seems like we do have a lot of paranormal stuff that does happen. Like, you know, Gettysburg is you know, pretty much in my backyard. I know that there's been other, like, more notable ghost sightings that happen here and, you know, kind of grew up in that and just always found myself interested in that. I know that the Loch Ness Monster has always kind of piqued my interest, but, you know, I don't have Scotland in, <laughs> in my backyard, so can't really go investigate that too much. But, you know, just trying to find out anything and everything about cases that are close by and things like the New Jersey Devil. Uh, you know, I looked into that and got really excited about that one as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the the Lake Champlain, which is sort of uh, similar to Loch Ness Monster uh, Champ. That would be a uh, closer. I'm a firm believer in the idea that everywhere has folklore, you know, like there are people say, oh, my area doesn't have any cool folklore. And then I, I look into it and I can find, you know, at least some folklore, like every 
community has stories, I think that even if you have just two people together, eventually there'll be some kind of sharing of a story in that way, like their family stories and things like that. And today's family stories are tomorrow's folklore legends. So, you know, with people live together, stories happen. You know, you couldn't stop folklore even if you announced it, said, okay, guys, no more folklore starting right now. You couldn't stop it. They would just, what you'd be doing then is creating uh, legends without calling them legends, you know? So I, I do believe that there, there is folklore everywhere. The series Monsters Of uh, is a pretty good sort of collection of individual states. Like there's Monsters of West Virginia by Rosemary Ellen Golly, and there's Monsters of Virginia. And I find if you type in, go to like Amazon or eBay or whatever, type in the name of your state followed by UFO or followed by Bigfoot, you know, or followed by ghosts you're likely to find a book that is sort of a, a collection of those kinds of stories. We, uh, I think that's one of the, the best use of books like that, as opposed to just being entertainment or writing like novel format. The best thing is to have like all the data in one sort of place, you know, sort of cat like a category. Um, an example of that would be uh, Joshua Cutchins has a book called the, the Trojan Feast, which is about all the strange food relations to the paranormal and the Fortean phenomena. It goes into like, you know, fairies and the different uh, food items they bring and, you know, the, the famous flying saucer pancake story that everyone uh, loves to repeat so much. And then there's um, The Brimstone Deceit by Joshua Cutchins, and it's about that common trend or motif in these stories of the, uh, the sulfur smell, the brimstone. So I find that books like that are very helpful for research, especially when they have the, the extensive bibliography that he has in the back the uh, trends and patterns and parallels when you have a book that is like, okay, here's everything that I found that has to do with this state or something like that. Or just here's everything to do with this county. If we could get that specific, that'd be really cool. So I think that's kind of the, the best uh, books to go for. Um, also is, um, you know, sort of the data books. Like um, John Heal is pretty good at coming up with these um, sort of data format things and listing out like an index or like a a data sheet like Strange Creatures of Time and Space has like an index of Mothman sightings. Uh, Passport to Magonia by Jacques Vallée. The first half of the book is, you know, his speculation, his theorizing, which is excellent. But then the second half of the book is all data. Like it's like name of the witness, location, date. It's that classic who, what, when, where, why. And it goes back to David Webb. He had something like that as well. Worked for Hynix Center for UFO Studies. And he laid out that same kind of format where it's like, okay, the witness location, the the story, brief summary of the story, paraphrase, all that good stuff, and then source it. I found that to be the best sort of way of cataloging these things. And that's what I've done uh, on my website, Helion.org, and that's how I keep my archive, the, the best way to do it. And um, one of the researchers who's gone the furthest with that is Albert Rosales, who has put together the excellent Humanoid Encounters series. And that book had, like that book series, it's chronological, data in bulk. And those are the ones I think are really good. A more modern example in 2010 would be Silent Invasion by uh, Stan Gordon. It's another one of those that starts off with some speculation and then has the data just right there for you. So I think those, those are some good recommendations of, um, you know, people who are actually putting the, the data in a format that is useful and digestible, that is comprehensive. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do. And that's, you know, my small part of trying to work towards this big collective database is... Um, you know, putting my stuff out there as much as I can on Keelian.org. I kind of go down that database and add to it and then update the website in waves. And it's a printer-friendly website. People can print that off, add that to their folders, and then, you know, hopefully we'll get somewhere. So that's what I'm trying to do. It'd be really good to take this data and extrapolate it into uh, statistics, which is something I very rarely see done. John Keel did it with the Wednesday phenomena, where he said that more sightings happen on Wednesday, but not a lot of people do that with statistics. I found one book that is a, a pretty modern book. It's called The UFO Sightings Desk Reference from 2001 to 2015, and it's by Cheryl Costa and Linda Miller Costa, and it essentially takes from the, the big groups like, uh, you know, Center for UFO Studies and things like that, and pulls that all together to give a statistic of all 50 states, of what day the sightings most occur on, what months and all that from these given years. And so I thought that was a really, really well put together sort of um, idea. I love to see more stuff like that. So you guys have any takes on that, the whole statistical analysis? 
another good book to, or another good author to kind of throw in that mix. I don't know if you've ever delved into the missing 411 uh, phenomena that David Polites writes about, but all his books are absolutely broken up in a way that are name, date, place, time, uh, age, sex, you know, was there any, uh, physical ailments, disabilities, blah, 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 about, you know, the individual people that have gone missing. And he does extrapolate that into data points and into statistics to where he's been able to track, you know, patterns all around the, the world and in various regions, you know, almost nailed down to exactly when you could almost expect someone to go disappearing again. So, I mean, that's that's a pretty good uh, book series to delve into. Yeah, he's he's mentioned uh, John Keel before, and John Keel is, of course, uh, one of my favorite authors, and he's the guy who wrote the Mothman Prophecies, and I think he has a, a, a similar style when it comes to The Witness, because John Keel said, learn everything you can about The Witness, ask him what they had for breakfast, so that's uh, probably what he does as well. Um, but yeah, that makes me wonder, you know, something that I dream about is the idea where you could analyze the location, analyze the, the sort of the type of witness and predict where the next thing's going to happen and be there ready with a camera, you know, like actually get so good at it that you can predict it. That would be the ultimate thing, I feel. Oh, and I, I keep mentioning the Center for UFO Studies. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great book called uh, Grassroots UFO by Michael Swords, and it is a reprint of a lot of the data that they have from the Center for UFO Studies. I mean, one thing I will say is that, you know, all research and, you know, science most definitely is built on the shoulders of giants. And, you know, I'm right there with you. It's like, let's try to get together, try to make a process, try to, you know, collect this information, collect this data. And, you know, I think this is going down the right track. If there is anyone who'd want to join the society, this is an open invitation. Uh, I have my direct messages on Twitter open, so if you're interested, send me a message, and then I can send you an invite link, and we can add more to the group, more correspondence, more points of view. Uh, at some point, I'd love to do something tangible, something that is physically out there. I'm not a publisher, and I don't expect to write a book anytime soon, but I would love to do something like that. I know that uh, newsletters have gone the way of the dinosaurs, as I said before. Digital ones, I feel, don't quite cut it, but I would love to get something tangible out there to say, okay, this team is actually doing something, and, you know, YouTube videos are one thing, but I don't want to just be a podcaster. I want to do some, some actual good here, you know. Uh, one idea I had, uh, sort of continuing the roles of the greats or the very influential is to fill in the roles of things they did. And one person who, as I said, was very influential in, uh, for better or for worse, is Gray Barker. Uh, he had a press called the Saucerian Press, and he would publish contactee stories. So if there's like a story of a contactee, of a, a witness who saw something bizarre, he would publish their story if they were able to write a book about it, or if they were able to find someone to relay their story to who could write a book, he would publish it. Now, he wasn't the most hands-off, but I would like if there would be more publishers who have a hands-off approach who are able to publish these sort of contact these stories because I think that's a role that hasn't been filled. I suppose there is self-publishing. There's the internet. Anyone can make up a blog post and things like that, but I would love if there were more people publishing these sort of stories so that the outcasts can be heard and the people who have very bizarre sightings, no matter how bizarre, can at least have their stories written down. So I welcome any anomalous publications, especially the ones that are very respectful and hands-off, to, to do that sort of work. Because anyone who does something like that, you know, they're doing something for the field, and it's in my best interest for this field to thrive. So that's just something I wanted to bring up. You know, put that out there in the ether. Maybe someone will pick that up. And uh, also, uh, if there is anyone who has, like, archives, like extensive archives, or, you know, maybe they knew someone who was a 40 and maybe their uncle had a big box of flying saucer fanzines or they, you know, were a 40 in some way, uh, if you can get in contact with me, if I could get a hold of those archives, I would digitize them, I would give them their due respect and do everything I can so that they won't go lost and they won't, they won't end up in the dustbins of history like so many other of these people's work and you know so if anyone has that and they're looking for a place to put that uh, get in contact with me that's something that I am always working towards trying to do final question which is what do you guys think of the Appalachian Mystery Society and what can be improved on anything any input you guys have about the society uh, I think we're off to a very good start I think 
you know, starting the conversation, mm -hmm. building the foundation to where, you know, this can be something that can carry on for years to come. You know, it, it's all got to start somewhere and by, you know, getting these conversations going and getting people engaged and, you know, pulling in various ideas from various backgrounds, I think is, is a good way to, to use diversity to strengthen. So, yeah, I think we're on a, on a really good start here. Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree is that I really think that we've kind of hit the ground running and we're I think we're off to a really good start. Like I've been watching a lot of the the discussions and I may not be commenting on every single thing, but I really do feel so that, you know, it's really engaging. It's really fascinating what people are coming to the table with. And I just feel as though that it's off to a great start. And I think the only place we got to go from this point is up. Just kind of keep looking to the future. Mm -hmm. we've, we've got uh, 12 members so far or 12 correspondents. So that's pretty good. Um, like I said, I hope that it can continue even if this, you know, incarnation of it falls apart. I, I totally give permission to some Appalachian in the future to take this idea and run with it. I don't care as long as it's being done well. And um, I also encourage anyone else who is thinking about it, who lives, you know, maybe somewhere outside the Appalachian region, if you are interested in starting a organization or uh, collectivizing your research or organizing in some way, I encourage you to do so. And if you do quality work, maybe we can work together and, you know, maybe there can be some uh, Midwest Paranormal Society, West Coast Paranormal Society, Southern Paranormal Society, and then we can have um, collaborations and really get a handle on what's really going on here and, you know, attempt to solve these mysteries or, if nothing else, at least understand what's going on in the minds of the people. Okay, I was going to ask uh, Best Virginia if there's anything with his history orient and his um, photography uh, sort of focus, if there's anything we could do in that era specifically for the Mystery Society and also just give me your, your general uh, takes on that. Yeah, um, I think just documenting as much as possible trying to you know talk to and get as many uh outside voices as possible in on it um personally myself as much as i enjoy folklore and the supernatural and stuff um i i am a rather large skeptic i do kind of view the paranormal like the same way i uh enjoy Fleetwood Mac. I don't believe that anyone in that band actually had any emotional connection to each other by the time they actually started recording, but I do really appreciate um, people's experiences because I believe even if there is a rational explanation for something, the way it can affect people, um, especially psychologically, it can ultimately have... Um, long-lasting effects on them so i think uh I, I i do appreciate um studying the supernatural and the paranormal even though i've also had some experiences that years and months later i personally can't explain um but yeah i think just getting interviews with people figuring out the who what when where why um especially the when and not just geographically but time wise and understanding where those accounts fit into trends of the day other maybe geopolitical um events that were going on at the time um, for example a lot of uh, UFO and a lot of cryptid sightings uh, took place during the Cold War, took place at this time period of kind of heightened uh, paranoia in general. I don't think that's completely coincidental, so I think by being able to put historical and geographical connections to a lot of these accounts and stories can give them more context Um and hopefully more understanding of them. Yeah, because I know that history has to play some kind of role in this. You can't ignore that aspect of it, although people might find that counterintuitive. Like, okay, mystery society, you know, what, what does this have to do with history? But I definitely do think that history is a big component of this. It influences uh, culture, it influences history, psychology, all those things you mentioned. And, you know, I'm also interested in historical mysteries, so that's a, a way it ties in. But, you know, there's a reason that I go by Mothman Historian. History is a big part of it. And so that's something we definitely need to continue to try to make a part of it. Photography, you know, like sometimes it's good 
just to go to the sighting location and film it, you know, so that you can do a narration, talk about the story and show like this is where that happened. So what you do, I feel, is definitely a part of, you know, what this society is aiming for, even if it might sound sort of uh, beside the point. Um, mm -hmm. As for the skepticism thing, I welcome all skeptics. I am a skeptic. Uh, I think many Fortians are skeptics. Charles Fort's probably the biggest skeptic in the world. So, yeah, I definitely welcome that because I, I feel this is important regardless. You know, it influences things and it is something that I think we all agree should be documented for whatever reason. As long as we uh, agree on that one goal, that's something to organize around, that's something to come together around, is we have a shared goal of, for whatever reason, UFO stories, Sasquatch stories, ghost stories are important and should be documented. I know you said in your video you've had some pushback from people who say ghost stories aren't important and they don't matter. So I'm glad that, you know, you're someone who's like, no, these, these are stories that are important and they matter. So definitely. Yeah. Um... You know, we we keep seeing uh, these different accounts kind of popping up from the very beginning of human history as far as uh, weird creatures, giants, um, events and lights in the sky, spirits. You know, they are pretty much just as much of a part as being human. It doesn't matter um, what time period or even where in the world it was. It seems like every single uh, society has kind of had their own translations and experiences with these things, and it's really hard to rule them out when people separated by thousands of miles and hundreds of years have very similar experiences. Mm -hmm. I think that goes to the idea of the archetype or the, um, you know, a certain idea that's lodged in the, the gray matter of humanity because we all you know human beings evolved with a certain certain set brain uh, so I, I think there are certain ideas that for whatever reason resonate more than others and that's where some of these stories could come from or it could be the way that these things present themselves because that's what we'd understand or because that's uh, the way we contextualize it like looking through a kaleidoscope so definitely on that usually work in solitude but this is an undertaking that I've done so that I can uh, reach out and uh, collaborate with people because what good are unshared archives or researchers buried under piles of books without expressing what they learn? So that's very much the point of this. And so I think we've had a very productive discussion here. So I thank you folks for, for showing up and for being open and having a conversation with me. Thank you all very much. If you guys have any uh, final parting words before I do the outro here, uh, you can go down the line. Uh, David. I appreciate the opportunity of, uh, letting me come within the group and, uh, you know, being able to, to, yeah, help or well, hopefully moving forward, share a lot of ideas and experiences with, uh, with everyone. So yeah, I appreciate you uh, getting this started. Me personally, I just want to see this group keep moving forward, keep studies going on and just see what's out there. Um, yeah, just thanks for having me. And it was good, uh, talking to everyone and, uh, sharing, ideas and stuff um i'm on youtube at the best virginian and also on twitter at uh best underscore virginian and that's about everything i have going just my videos and uh photography and occasionally get in trouble with some uh charleston politicians so that's about everything I have going for me. Okay, well, I, I'm, now I'm interested in what that is. Um, I've just gotten in trouble uh, from time to time, especially with individuals involved with a rather large and well-known West Virginia resort. Um, hmm. Yeah, kind of. Uh, they don't mention anything about for how old it is and how it's been used as a military hospital and different things. They, they don't mention anything about any paranormal or ghost activity there, so I might have accused the owner of evicting all the ghosts. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to bring this uh, meeting to a close now, and I will close off with uh, what I feel is a quote that started all. This is um, The Book of the Damned by Charles Fort, 1919, and he says, A procession of the damned. By the damned, I mean the excluded. We will have a procession of data that science has excluded. Battalions of the accursed. Captains of the pallid data that I have assumed will march. You'll read them, or they'll march. Some of them are livid, and some of them are fiery, and some of them are rotten. 
Some of them are corpses, skeletons, mummies, twitching, tottering, animated by companions that have been damned alive. There are giants that will walk by through sound sleep. The naive and the pedantic, the bizarre and the grotesque, the sincere and the insincere, the profound and the puerile, a stab and a laugh. The power that has been said of all these things is that they are damned by dogmatic science, but they will march. The procession of the damned. So that was uh, 1919, Charles Fort wrote that. And ever since then, all the way through the saucers of 1947, the Sasquatch of the 50s, the, the Mothman in the 60s, all these things, the procession of the damned, the excluded data, the outcasts, they have marched. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll see you in time. Mountaineers are always free. Was the ending too much with the, the super uh, pretentious Charles Fort quote? No, I, I thought it was fitting. But yeah, okay. Thanks, folks. Peace.